Well, hello everyone. It's Patricia Warby of Alchemy Therapies and my emotional audit and another in my weekly updates. And this week I'm doing a review of Michael Pollan's excellent book, How to Change Your Mind, The New Science of Psychedelics. Um, this book has been out a while. I think, um, as usual, uh, the hardback comes out first and then the uh, softback, which is 2018. Uh, this is a Penguin version, 2019. It may be particular the cover may be particular to the UK because I found that with a lot of books US and UK markets are very different uh, and often the covers will reflect that. Um, Michael Pollan is a, a very well-known journalist writer. Uh, I've read several of his books um, some on food were some of the first books that turned my attention to what we now think of as ultra processed foods and why nutrition is so key to mental and physical health, for instance. Um, but he's also written on um, sort of nature, um, all sorts of topics. Whenever he turns his attention, you can be sure the book will be worth reading. He's a wonderful writer, truly just excellent wordsmith. Um, and every sentence, you know, is carefully put together and you kind of you, you take time to read Michael Pollan's books. They are extraordinary. Um, this is his most recent book. In fact, I don't think he's done one since since this, but it's absolutely up there with my top 10 books because um, not just because he's a brilliant writer, but because this subject matter is just so interesting to me right now as I'm writing my own book on altered states and how psychedelics and breath work and um, EMDR can create similar rewirings in our brain and cause us to lose um, issues that are troubling us related to emotional memory. So um, I, I was going to write a lot more about kind of psychedelics and mushrooms in particular but I've, I've changed my focus recently because a lot of the clients that have been coming to me have been finding extraordinary resolution just by me using eye movements with the MDR and so I thought maybe I should write a little bit more about that because not everyone is going to want to take psychedelics and indeed it's still illegal <laughs> so um, we can't yet talk about it as a viable alternative to antidepressants but I think that's where we're headed and what I love about this book, um, it's it's very well planned and as well as executed. So he talks about the, the recent renaissance in psychedelic research. Um, he talks about where it comes from in terms of the natural history of some of the plants that it relates to, because um, he's covering a, a wide remit here from LSD, psilocybin, that's magic mushroom, um, even DMT dimethyltryptamine um, and, and lots of things in between. But those are the three he's mainly focusing on in this book. And then he talks about the history, of course, of LSD, which was, you know, such a miracle drug. Most people don't realize, but it came in in the 1940s. Um, it was being researched by top, you know, medical research departments as a possible uh, cure for depression, um, for addiction and for, you know, mentally um, deranged states, you know, like psychosis and so on. And it was considered a bit of a wonder drug. Um, but then the 60s hit and what was meant to be a controlled experiment to find out whether it could be useful medically became an uncontrolled experiment socially and societally to uh, tune in uh, zone out and drop out or whatever it was but um it was basically uh you know the, the the call to arms for a generation that no longer wanted to take part in the culture of the vietnam war and just the general uh cold war and all the sort of government machinations um and just wanted to be free and I think LSD played a very big part in that because it, as I'll explain in a minute, it does have a sort of loosening effect on the brain. And, and it was sort of part of the counterculture. And then Timothy Leary, who was a professor, um, was famously demoted and uh, he became the sort of bad boy. And, uh, you know, basically it was then made illegal. Uh, President Nixon, who really wanted to carry on fighting the Vietnam War, 
and he didn't want all the young people refusing to sign up, decided to have the war on drugs. And that 1968 was when uh, that was signed. And um, a lot of these chemicals, which had really promising attributes medically, like LSD, was made, uh, you know, restricted and made a class A drug. And, and we still see that today, you know, 40 years or so later, um, many of the drugs that would be very helpful for people are still restricted and can only be used in research contexts. So he goes into the history in a great deal of detail, which is absolutely fascinating. I have to say the history is fascinating. All the different um, competing voices, you know, from the sort of academic who wanted serious study to the wild, you know, outpourings of Leary and his colleagues who wanted a free for all. And indeed, you know, um, did believe it was a universal panacea and wanted to medicate everybody and put it in the water, um, which of course is unethical and doesn't actually work because not everybody responds the same. So the full, full half of the book really is dedicated to the build up of that story. Um, he then talks about his own experiences. So uh, taking three of the different drugs that I've mentioned and, and how they vary, how they differ, uh, what his experiences were and this is you know because he's he's conscientious you know as a writer he's not going to just invent things he's going to experience them for himself he did with the all the other books I've read you know he, he changed his diet he changed his life you know to to try and work out uh, what's going on and and therefore inform the writing um, but I think honestly the the meat and potatoes, as it were, of this book begins from chapter five. Uh, and I mean, it's all good. It's all really good. But from chapter five onwards, this book just lights up. And it's really talking about the neuroscience chapter five, which um, is just fascinating. So basically what psychedelics seem to do is they switch off the reducing valve, which is called the default mode network, in your brain which is like a it's a mixture of different brain regions that operate when you are kind of not focused on anything when you're just kind of living life normally and it's an attentional um valve really it dictates what you are made aware of and what you're not and so i guess like aldous huxley wrote in the 1950s it's like it's like a a window to the world um, rather than the world itself because we don't perceive the world as it really is we perceive it as our brains present it to us and and often that in order to cope it has to reduce the amount of information that it's dealing with in any given moment and so it has to make predictions about what it's seeing based on past experience of course and it has to reduce the the salience of everything around you to just what it considers important. Um, now, what psychedelics do when they disable the default mode network is basically the self, which is, of course, a learned uh, experience of what we consider normal and how we normally react, disappears. The, some would call that the ego or the id, um, Freudians would disappears basically and we find ourselves merging with that which we perceive in other words the self and the world become one now that might sound a little frightening um you know it can be in in the wrong hands you know if it's not guided properly um when guided properly and in a loving supportive environment where you are uh you're taught what to expect and you're counseled before and after what seems to happen then is that the normal sense of um this disconnection that we feel actually we regard that as normal dissolves and we become one with everything and we are flooded with a sense of love as the ultimate meaning in life um and, and ordinary people who have these psychedelic experiences previously not given to hyperbole or, you know, spiritual um, kind of phrasing will come up with the most amazing descriptions of how they were one with nature and the world and 
how love suffused everything. And what I really love about um, the next two chapters actually are, um, is he, he goes into a great deal of detail on how therefore this altered state can be used in the treatment of people in psychotherapy. And so chapter six uh, looks at th three avenues that that can be done with dying people, for instance, with people with addictions um, and people who are suffering from uh, long-term chronic conditions like depression and anxiety. And unusually, uh, he does cover some of the, the British research that's going on, because a lot of Americans are very focused on what's happening in their country, because, of course, it has a massive research arena and um, very seldom do you need to refer to anything happening elsewhere. But Michael actually does a great job of talking about some of the work that's going on at Imperial College London, because it's one of the centres in the world for psychedelic research. Uh, there are There is some at Stanford, some at NYU, um, but Imperial is up there. And Imperial College in in particular, it's, it's actually based at Hammersmith Hospital in West London, uh, was somewhere I worked when I was a fledgling research scientist. So it didn't last very long. My career didn't last very long at that point. Um, I went into uh, studying mus muscular dystrophy, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is a, uh, a heritable condition. Um, and I loved my time at Hammersmith. It was a fabulous place, um, but, you know, research or certainly that department didn't seem to um, work out for me. But so here I have this personal connection with some of the work going on here. But of course, that was 20 or 30 years ago. And what's happening now couldn't have happened then. It would have been um, just nobody wanted to touch psychedelic research. It was a no, no. It's really only since the late 90s, early 2000s that uh, there's been this resurgence or renaissance, some people are calling it. And um, that's happening in the UK under the auspices of David Nutt, K-N-U-T-T, -T, and Robin Carhart Harris, um, who is a sort of younger. He was a graduate student. He's become a fully fledged. I think he's a professor himself now, but um, uh, and his team. And it was it was recently shown on uh, uh, there was a program on BBC TV a, a couple of years ago about people who'd gone through some of the um, treatments, the interventions that they were offering for long term depression and how amazing it had been. Of course, it didn't last because they were only able to have one one treatment, which isn't enough to overwrite the patterning of the past, which is going to be the subject of my book. Um, now, Robin has written a very influential paper, which I will link in the uh, description below, which is called The Entropic Brain, A Theory of Conscious States Informed by Neuroimaging Research with Psychedelic Drugs. Um, now, he was one of the first people to look at what happens in the brain using fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, to show what happens when people are on under the influence of psychedelic drugs. And actually it forms the frontispiece um, of the book. And also at the back, this is on, on I think psilocybin. You can see this is a mapping of the interconnectedness in the brain. Okay. Now, now his theory is that um, the entropic brain Entropy is a term of kind of, uh, usually we think of it as a disordered, disordered state um, when we talk about entropy. But in terms of the brain, what it basically means is it, it kind of lights up new connections and takes away this default structure that, that we regard as reality. Um, and one of the purposes of the default mode network is to, as I said, cut down the amount of information that the brain is having to evaluate on a you know moment by moment basis and to do that it has to do something called predictive coding it has to base what it's evaluating on past experience um, and that of course is to avoid uncertainty and so if we think about entropy as uh, a way of avoiding uncertainty I think that's a really uh, good way of um, looking at it it's like entropy is the equivalent of uncertainty and and the brain doesn't like it so it will try and control entropy by making things predictable 
And, and so that's what most people regard as normal consciousness. You know, your day-to-day -day focus on um, the past or the future. You're very seldom in the present and you often are making judgments about what you're perceiving based on your previous experience. And you're, you're very focused on what's wrong as well and not on what works uh, or what's right. We're often in states of high stress, high dysregulation neurologically, and we would consider this normal. Um, and this is what, what he's saying is that, that entropy may be the way that the brain rewires itself to create new states of awareness, which is very similar, in fact, to what a young child does the kind of lantern child childhood awareness, right, where a child will just be taking in everything in a very broad way, as opposed to the sort of more laser focus of the adult. Um, so it's it's really interesting, that theory, and I, I'm going to read the paper um, because I think that will answer a lot of the questions that I have. Um, this time of young childhood or what we mimic when we have a psychedelic experience is a time of great neuroplasticity. So not only do we um, reconnect different parts of the brain that haven't been connected for a long time, that sort of childhood sense of awe and wonder at the world, but then we can fix those states if, if we know how to afterwards. And, and so neuroplasticity really is where the rewiring can take place. Now, whether that's permanent or temporary depends largely on the set and setting that this is done in. And so that's something he goes into a lot more um, in the final chapters. And, um, you know, it's, it's very interesting because he kind of talks to people who've been through it. Um, he talks to some of the researchers and what their hopes are for this treatment. Um, he compares and contrasts a lot of the different theories for how this could work. Um, and, you know, he's saying that the potential is huge. This expansive awareness, this broader awareness of who we are and what the meaning of life is, is not only going to help people experiencing disease states, addictions, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, anxiety, depression, uh, PTSD and trauma, but it also has the potential to rewire people who are by all intents and purposes well in that it can enhance creativity and focus and the ability to think more broadly and problem solve at a level which is almost impossible in the normal default mode way of being so um, it could be a productivity tool and it is actually being used that way in silicon valley um, although nobody's talking about it because it's all being done um, privately by some of the individuals there who are open to the experience and michael himself has been to talk i think it was to google um, to the workers at google there is a, a a recording of that which you can find on youtube of him talking to people who are obviously interested and some are experimenting with this. In, so they're microdosing low amounts uh, periodically to enhance their creativity. Now, that's a very different approach to having a full dose under kind of, uh, uh, let's say, a, a psychological uh, framing. OK. Um, we also see its use in cancer treatment where maybe people are have a um you know uh, they're at stage three or stage four they have a real fear of death um and what we're finding is not only can psychedelics help them overcome the fear of death but it, it in so doing it can often change the pattern that led to the cancer in the first place and remission is sometimes also possible um but certainly for all forms of trauma now now trauma is my specialism and just looking at how trauma forms and, and trauma is a very broad definition as you you may or may not know but um it's not just bad things that happen to you it's things that needed to happen that didn't happen it's what you feel about what happened or didn't happen inside you and it's a very personal experience uh, which most people coming through a childhood have some form of trauma, some very much worse than others. And it does change your beliefs about yourself 
uh, and your behaviors when you come across situations in adult life that have that evoke memories of the past so if it has a similar signature if you like and so I think psychedelics and altered states of being have a real potential to rewire the memory component, which, by the way, the default mode network also kind of depresses. When you remove the default mode network, you have access to emotional memory that you didn't have before. And that's why I think uh, EMDR is also doing the same thing, because when I work with people using eye movement desensitization, which is just basically moving the eyes from side to side, I can see memories pinging in or awarenesses pinging in because the eyes signal that with a blink or a double blink. Um, and then you can ask the person what just came in there and they'll tell you, I just remembered something and it's usually from long, long time ago, or it can be more recent, but they would forgotten it. It's like you are released from this constraint as to what you pay attention to and you're able to cherry pick, if you like, well, the brain does it for you, the, the, the salient memories that need rewiring. And so I think I'm on to something here with um, altered states and psychedelics are really important, but I'm not allowed to use them. I'm not licensed to use them. Uh, I would love to do that. And maybe one day in the future, if it's possible to train in psychedelic assisted therapy, I will be. Uh, but for the moment, my tool of EMDR, I believe, does a very similar thing when used in uh, connection with a safe uh, heart to heart, you know, connection. Um, that's really important. And that's the set and setting of my work. OK, they talk about set and setting. Set is to do with mindset, you know, what you believe about what you're, you're doing. And setting is how it's done and, and the environment you're in. Because as Gabo Mate often says, you know, um, mind and body are not two separate things. They're very much connected. And humans are very, very connected to their environments. And the more sensitive they are, the more so. So it's very important to have that, that safe container for this kind of work. And that's what I aim to do with people. But um, Michael has certainly written an important book and one that will remain on my bookshelf. And in fact, what I'm, I've, I've begun to do is make notes from it because I want to obviously incorporate some of his information in mine and uh, build on that, obviously. So I'm hoping I'm hoping my book will be out sometime in the summer. Or I'll keep you posted on that one. But for now, Michael Pollan, How to Change Your Mind, highly recommended. Um, somebody said on the back, um, a mind altering book full of transformations. And I would agree just reading it expanded my understanding. Um, and, you know, it's it's beautifully referenced. It has a full index, um, fully the bibliography is fully referenced and it even has um, it has a glossary as well. So uh, which I think is a sign of a really well researched book. So please, um, I don't have any links to this guy. I don't um, get any money from recommending things. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm here just to tell you when I found something really good and share it with you. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, um, do go ahead and get yourself a copy. And if you'd be interested in exploring some mind altering states to recover your health and vitality, then find me on alchemytherapies.co.uk. Take care of yourselves, everybody. Bye for now. Bye bye.